It all started with a vivid, reoccurring dream. I dreamt that I entered a forest that I have never seen before. Everything felt so real. I was walking with my feet bare, and I could feel the murky soil pressed in between my toes as I leave my footprints on the path. I could feel the leaves brushing against my skin as I walked deeper into an untapped part of the woods. It was said that an average person would dream four to seven different scenarios in a single night, and most of those multiple scenes will be forgotten as the person wakes up from a complete eight hours sleep. You will actually notice this happening, even if you couldn't remember it, or at least you would know that you had another dream aside from what you could recall. In my case, it was as clear as a conscious memory, as if I were merely recalling a scene that was etched into my mind for a long time. I could swear that I was only having a single reoccurring dream at the time. For several nights, I was in that same forest, crossing the same path, doing the same thing. And as this dream repeats, the scene gradually extends further. At first, I was just seeing myself tracing an unknown path, but as the dream lengthened, I was led to a hidden place where something terrifying was about to unfold. My mind is usually awfully occupied by the daily activities of my everyday life. The buzz of a noisy city that never sleeps combined with my hardly reasonable salary as a bartender in a beat-down pub were more than enough for me not to worry about something as unimportant as a mere dream. After all, sleeping was the only time I could put my mind to rest. I would have preferred to keep ignoring it, but it gradually became disturbing. As the dream extended further and further, it revealed what would come next to the scene that began as nothing more but an aimless stroll in the woods that I've never seen before. As I pedaled through this damp soil in this unknown wood, shoving off countless branches in my way, the path had gotten tighter and the bushes denser. Inside my dream, I acted as if I knew exactly where I should go, what I should do. I ripped off the layers and layers of vines blocking the way and forced myself in. I walked deeper and deeper as I cleared the way, and I found an entrance of a cave below the forest ground, hidden behind the dense layers of old tangled roots. And there were faint symbols etched on the stone that I didn't recognize. It didn't look like hieroglyphics nor Celtic but rather something that looked more tribal and ancient. On the night that I first saw this cave, I woke up just before I entered it. At that point, I couldn't just shake off the thoughts of this weird reoccurring dream. I became curious with this cave in the ground behind the roots and the vines. I wanted to see what was inside. I wanted to see where it led to and I kept on thinking about it even at work. The pacing of my dream was rather slow. Sometimes it would reveal new things, but most of the time it wouldn't. I've been having the same dream for weeks now, but that was just as far as it went at the time. In my attempt to forget about it, I engaged into a drunken conversation with one of the customers who sat at the bar. I needed to keep my head on in reality stop concerning myself with something that wasn't real. Bert, an owner of a small studio not far from the establishment, invited me to attend an open house gallery that he just launched. I agreed on a whim, and we went there the night after. I came to this gallery so that I could divert my attention to something else aside from my dreams. However, it did entirely the opposite of my goal. As I walked around and viewed the paintings made by amateur artists who wanted to make a name for themselves, a particular painting gave me goosebumps as it fueled my curiosity about the place that I kept on dreaming about. You see, portrayed on one of the paintings 
was a small peak of a cave entrance behind an overgrown shrub. It had the same faint carvings of symbols on the stone similar to what I saw in my dream. I do not believe in a predestined fate. I do not believe in luck, and perhaps it was just an oddly convenient circumstance that I was invited into this gallery, saw this painting, and met the artist who created it. I asked Bert who did the painting, and he introduced me to Anna, who was there at the time. Needless to say, I immediately asked Anna what her painting was about, and her answer surprised me. She told me that, like me, she saw this in her dream. When I told her that I was also dreaming about the same thing, she didn't believe me at first, and even thought that it was just my weird way of trying to hit on her. But when I told her more about it, how it was reoccurring scene, and how I got to the entrance of the cave, I could see in her face that she was quite perplexed about it. Everything that I said was the same with what she was experiencing during her sleep, especially how it felt more like a memory than a vivid scenery patched up by the things that we experienced in our reality. I asked her if there was anything she knew about the symbols carved on the stone, but she told me that she was just as clueless as I was. After meeting with Anna, I got more intrigued with the matter. She also probably felt the same. Needless to say, two individuals who didn't know each other having the same dream was far from ordinary. A couple of nights later, the dream extended once again. This time, I saw myself entering the cave. The light was barely illuminating the way, and the path inside was troublesomely rough and descending sharply. I could barely see anything, but it seemed that I know where to go. I was but an observer in my dream all this time. Having a first-person view of someone who was headed somewhere, I could feel some unnatural etches as I ran my hands against the cave walls, though hardly visible. I saw that there were more symbols carved inside, similar to the ones at the mouth of the cave. In my inexperienced and abrupt assessment, I could tell that the symbols, although similar, were carved by different people. It looked like a language that a certain group or community once had, and they walked the same exact path, leaving their traces on the walls. On the same day when I woke up, I was already planning on going to the gallery once again to tell Anna about my dream. But in the middle of my shift in the pub, she came to me instead. Her dream that night also had the same pace as mine. She also walked inside the dark cave and saw the symbols on the wall. It was already strange that we were having the same dream, and it was even stranger that we were experiencing the same progression. However, there was one minor detail that was different in her experience. Anna told me that she could hear a stream of water inside the cave, which I didn't. We decided to exchange contact numbers so that we could update each other if our dream would progress further. A few days later, I received a message from Anna. Both our dreams haven't progressed yet, but she told me about something that she claimed I would find extremely intriguing. Ever since we met, she had been tirelessly searching for any information about our dream or what the symbols could mean. Pages after pages on different search engines, she looked thoroughly and was finally able to find one. She sent me the link to the site, and she was right. I was dumbfounded when I saw etches of the similar symbols on a blog. According to Alan, the author of the blog, he also saw this in his dream he was having for several weeks. He put every little detail of his experience into words, and they were almost perfectly identical to Anna and mine. The only difference in each of our dreams was right after we entered the cave. In Alan's case, the roots and the vines extended further in. Anna's was the stream, and mine was the steep descending path. 
What was even more interesting, aside from the eerie similarities, were how much research Alan had put into the matter. He claimed that the symbols resembled the ancient writings of a small, uncategorized community that existed thousands of years ago. The references he linked to were trivial, to say the least. The very limited information available, which was way before people knew that the world wasn't flat, looked like nothing more but a fabricated history meant for conspiracy theories. It was just a bunch of hearsays that were handed down from generation to generation, exaggerated and distorted as the time passed. Anna contacted Alan and gave a schedule, which the three of us could meet. Oddly enough, Alan was also contacted by someone before Anna did, and this person also said that he had the same dream as ours. We decided to meet in the pub where I was working. When the four of us finally met, Anna was surprised when she saw the person that Alan was talking about. He was her distant cousin, Samuel. Aside from this meeting, they never really talked to each other before. Another strange similarity we all had was how close our ages were. Anna and Samuel were both 23 years old. I was 24 and Alan was 26. We all talked about what we have seen in our shared dreams so far especially the slight differences that we had when we got inside the cave. But the most interesting one was Sam's. It seemed that his dream was slightly ahead of us three. Like ours, he entered the cave and noticed the symbols on the walls. The way he described it. The one he entered and seemed bigger. In my dream, the space was so tight that I could touch the walls on both sides when I stretched my arms. While in his, he said that the ceiling of the cave was too high for him to reach. The three of us entered the cave in our dream just recently. Sam, however, claimed that he had crossed the stream and was about to enter a chamber. It was new to the three of us. Now, The strangest thing that Sam said was what he saw along the entrance of this chamber inside the cave. He saw some pieces of shattered bones on his way. After hearing this, Alan shared to us his elaborate research about the symbols that we all saw. He still couldn't figure out what it meant, but he was guessing that it had something to do with the nameless tribe's religious belief. It was common for ancient tribes to use the caves for their spiritual practices. They would either use these closed spaces to form altars or even store the bodies of their relatives who passed away. Alan thought that the symbols must be some kind of prayers for the dead. But the big question remained unanswered, and that was, why we were all having the same dream. A day after our meeting, my dream progressed further. As I walked deeper into the dark cave, I finally surpassed the steep path. And below there, it was even darker. I was finally able to hear the flow of water. A few moments later, I felt a cold, shallow stream passing across my feet. I kept on walking blindly into the dark until I saw a very minute ray of light on the opposite side. Samuel was right. Beyond the stream was an entrance to a chamber. But before I even reached beyond the beam of light and into the chamber's door, my dream for that night was over. Right after I woke up, I had two messages from Anna and Alan. They both arrived near the entrance of the cave's chamber as well. Like Samuel, Alan also saw some pieces of human bones along his way. It was really dark on the path that I took, and my legs were below the water up to my knees. I couldn't tell if I was stepping on rocks or pieces of bone. Anna said that she felt like it was harder to breathe on her end. It seemed that she was finally far below the surface as well. With what we have known so far, it looked like we were all headed to the same place in our dream. The only difference was the path that we took to get there. The space far below the ground had more than one opening so it was easy to assume that the chamber had multiple entrances as well. 
I already expected that our dream had progressed at the same time. But what shocked me was the next message that Alan sent me a few hours later. He just discovered that his grandfather was a distant relative of Alan's mother. It seemed that Anna, Alan, and Samuel were all blood relatives. He asked me about my family as well, but there was nothing I could share. I was left in an orphanage and I grew up there. He was thinking that our relationship had something to do with what we were all experiencing. The only flaw to that theory was me. With that in mind, I decided to revisit the orphanage where I grew up in. Unfortunately, the person who took me in told me that I was just left at the gate when I was an infant. They didn't know the name of my real parents, nor seen the person who had left me there. All they had from my past was a knitted shawl that I was wrapped in when they got me. I brought the shawl with me and showed it to the others when we met. Apparently, Alan thought that the shawl alone might lead us somewhere. He said that the way the shawl was made might indicate where it was brought from. Since it was handmade, the style and pattern could be unique to the place where my real family originated. And if by any luck, that one of them had the same thing as a kid and kept it, but then our parents might have come from the same place, which would increase the chance that I might also be related to them as well. However, finding old things from their past wasn't as easy as we would have wanted. Inna apologized early on and said that she wouldn't have any way to help us in this matter because her parents got separated when she was a child so everything she owned was from her life in the city. Alan had an issue as well. He was not on good terms with his parents. The way he talked about them, it, it sounded like he was bearing hatred towards them. He moved away from their house long ago and had cut communication ever since, saying that his parents' rules were suffocating him. Given the inconvenient circumstance, the only place we could look at was Samuel's. We went there and began the search, opening a bunch of dusty boxes stored in his attic. He was staying with his aunt. Luckily, she stored a lot of things that belonged to Samuel's parents after they passed away. Most of it were actually the belongings of his father's brother that they kept in his memory. Unfortunately, we did not find any shawl that resembled mine. The only things that might give us a hint were a bunch of old family pictures that belonged to Samuel's family. However, most of them were taken after they moved to the city. While we were searching, Samuel shared to us how his dream progressed, since his was one pace ahead of ours. In his dream, he walked a very long hall leading to the chamber itself. He saw more carvings on the wall similar to the ones along the entrance of the cave, and something else. I could see on his face that he was scared as he recalled what he saw in his dream. He said that there were images etched on the walls along with the symbols. He described it like he was describing other ancient portrayals of practices from early civilizations. There was a figure etched on the wall like a god, surrounded by figures of people on their knees as if they were worshipping it. He wanted to see more of the carved delusions, but they were blocked by the piles of bones cramped against the walls to clear the path. I asked him why he was afraid about it, and he said that I would feel the same if I saw the figure of what the people were worshipping. He said that it looked more like a beast than a god. Alan interjected into our discussion and said that most of the gods that was worshipped before was meant to look intimidating so the people would obey it without question. And as Samuel and Alan were arguing, Anna lifted up an old picture and said that she could recognize where it was taken. They asked Samuel's aunt about it and she said that it was a bus station that was probably out of commission ages ago. It would have been easier if her aunt knew more about their past. Aside from Anna's mother, she said that she never really got acquainted with her other distant relatives. 
The only thing she could remember was helping Samuel's parents settle in when they moved into the city. The place where they came from never became a part of their discussions. However, the case of his father's brother had always been a mystery to her. She said that he went missing when he was around our same age. Anna said that she had a faint memory of being in that station, so there was a chance that her aunt was wrong. Since we had no other leads, we went to this place in the picture and saw that there was actually still one bus remaining that looked functional. We asked the operator where the bus was heading, and he said that there was only one route that this single bus takes ever since they established the terminal. He even said that if they ever stopped this service, the people on the other end of the route would have a really hard time transporting themselves or the goods that they need. Now, it was actually pretty silly to think that we went on our way just because of a strange dream that we were all having, but the things that it linked into was enough to convince me to go along with it. Every step we took so far was just as good as far-fetched guesses. From my shawl, to the picture, to a ride to a place that none of us knew. But even so, it would be nice to know where my real parents came from, whether they were dead or alive. If there was a very slight chance that this trip would get me to know more about them, well, I would take it. The dream just gave a way for the four of us to get acquainted with each other. At that point, I was already thinking that my parents might actually had a connection to theirs. Along the trip, I asked the others why they were all doing this. It seemed that Samuel just wanted to spend time with Anna, even if he didn't want to admit it. Anna had an artist's perspective about the matter. She was already into superficial and strange beliefs before all this began, so digging deeper into the situation was her natural response. On the other hand, Anna whispered to me that Alan believed that the place we were dreaming about might actually be an actual place where we could go to, and if that was the case, we might uncover something bigger than we realized. It took roughly five hours before we made it to the terminal on the other side. The place was nowhere near welcoming. There was only one person there, a tradesman of the only village residing in that remote area. He was there to pick up goods that the bus transported with us. Luckily, he was kind enough to give us a ride. We were actually more fortunate than we thought. The road wasn't meant for casual travelers. Aside from not having a distinct path, it was practically a deserted barren land where no one could shelter. That was one of the reasons why we were surprised when we entered an area with a very dense forest. The contrast between the dry land that we passed along the way and this gorgeous evergreen forest where the village resided was night and day, but despite of the healthy nature, like an oasis of a desert, the vibe of the village itself was rather dreary and oddly quiet. I assumed that the only people who could live there would be those who could hunt food for themselves. It was obvious they weren't used to outsiders, since everybody we passed turned their heads twice to have a good look at us. The community looked really small so they probably knew each of their neighbors well. Needless to say, none of us had ever been here before. We all grew up in the city, surrounded by the most convenient ways of living. We walked around until someone finally approached us instead of just staring. The old man asked us if we had a place to stay. We weren't really planning on staying, but he said that the bus only arrived at the station once every three days. He introduced himself to us as Gerald and offered us to stay in his home for a fee, and so we had no other choice but to agree. He toured us around, not that there was actually anything interesting to see, but just for the sake of showing a friendly gesture to us, unexpected visitors. 
After walking around aimlessly, Gerald prepared a meal for us. He was living on his own, so he was probably glad that he had company for the night, even though we were total strangers, or so I thought. As we were eating, Gerald shared to us how hard, simple yet peaceful, the life was living in this small, isolated village. He was actually funny and a bit of an eavesdropper, sharing the rumors about the other households that didn't really concern us. Along the conversation, Mr. Gerald started mentioning family names that he would relate to his jokes, and Alan heard one that was the same with his. We all just laughed it off as the old man said that it would be impossible that Alan could be related to the family that he mentioned. Little did he know, we were there to actually figure that out. That was when Anna decided to show him the old picture that led us here, and I also pulled out the shawl that it was wrapped with when I was left at the orphanage. After seeing those things, Mr. Gerald's cheerful expression suddenly changed. He looked shocked and quite alarmed. He asked us why we went to this village, and we finally told him our true motives. We didn't plan on hiding it anyway. We were just waiting for the right time to say it. However, we did not expect Mr. Gerald to react in such a way. He looked spooked and went mad for some reason. As he stared at the picture, we introduced ourselves properly and the three of them mentioned their surnames. He asked Anna how she got the picture, and how I got the shawl. But before we even explained to him about how we all met each other, he bluntly told us that we shouldn't have arrived to the village. And when we heard the reason why, we were all flabbergasted and terrified. Based on a very old tale that was passed down from generation to generation, this thick, healthy forest surrounding the village did not exist before. There was a story about the first settlers on the place where the village now resides. They were said to be a small tribe that were direct descendants of a very old community. This unnamed tribe were members of other clans who wandered through the desert and met each other amidst their ferocious battles that lasted for days. In order to survive the harsh challenges of the dry land, they called a truce and decided to help each other instead. After this part of the story, it went from vaguely feasible to incredibly irrational. The story said that out of desperation, the tribesmen begged some god for help and this entity came to their aid. With the help of this god, a wide and dense forest suddenly appeared in the place which used to be completely lifeless. This also being placed with animals in the forest and provided a stream. By doing so, the tribe was able to survive against the odds. The life within this area was sufficiently sustained and flourished in a way that they see it today. But sadly, this healthy land came with a hefty price. Despite of being far from any threat against other more dominant groups, there was a reason why this tribe remained small. The god required sacrifices in exchange to his kindness. The story said that the tribe was comprised of four families as a whole. In exchange for the land, each of the family was required to give them one of their children. In appreciation for this god's miraculous aid at their worst time, the four families faithfully complied to his demand. Since this tribe was originally formed by the clashes of different clans, it was unavoidable that they would soon disagree with one another, so they decided to reside in different areas near the forest. Each of the four families decided to build their own communities, but despite their differences, they all worshipped the same god who saved them all from thirst and starvation. They built a temple for him in the heart of the forest, and for every 20 years, all the four families were required to sacrifice one of their children to him. Unfortunately, the next generation came, and one of the four families refused to obey their god's demand. And so, in his wrath, the almighty being destroyed most of the green land 
and killed most of the tribe's people. After this punishment, what was left of the healthy land and the people relying on it were cut to more than half. The survivors decided to stay together and answer to their god, whom they'd angered. And the descendants of those remaining survivors were said to be the ones who built this village as it is now. Because of the weight, the temple that the tribe's people built for their god sunk deeper and deeper until it disappeared under the forest ground. And like any other religion with a handful of followers, the defiance of the descendants towards their god would occur once in a while, fed with their unfaithfulness. The god made them fulfill their promise against their will. At the time when the community was asleep, he would manipulate the chosen sacrifices in relation to their family lineage to come to his hidden temple. He would remind them of their promise by showing them the path in their dream, and he would lead them the way unconsciously. The story was passed down from generation to the next generation to the next. It was probably altered several times. At the time of Mr. Gerald's generation, most of them no longer believed in this old tale. But unfortunately, there was one aspect of the story that was kept alive, and it was the worst part of all. Even if they didn't believe in it, this thing that the tribe's people worshipped has his way of making people obey his will without them knowing. Every 20 years, Four individuals from the village would go missing. They would sleepwalk and wander into the woods and never return. This incident happened to Mr. Gerald's older brother and to the generation before him. The picture that Anna brought was Sam's distant uncle, who also went missing. Before Mr. Gerald's older brother disappeared, he remembered that he was telling him something about a dream but he didn't pay any attention to it at the time. To them, the story was just a way to keep the kids from going into the woods at night. He looked very regretful as he was sharing his story to us. Right after that, he rose his voice and said that our families must have moved to different places in order to spare us from this inexplicable predicament. But we were foolish enough to return here on our own will just a day before the 20th year since the last disappearance of four other villagers. This was the reason why the villagers we came across looked uneasy and troubled. It wasn't because outsiders like us suddenly appeared, but because two decades had passed and they knew what was about to happen. We wanted to get away from the village right then and there. There were no means of transportation available at the time. We wanted to pay for the truck who picked up the goods at the terminal to take us far from here as he could, but he rejected our request right away. We couldn't blame him. He wanted to keep an eye on his own family. Mr. Gerald advised us that we should stay for the night, since it was when the sudden disappearances happened. He bolted the doors and chained the windows to make sure that no one could go in or out of the house. After hearing the story and the things that followed, the four of us remained wide awake. We promised each other that we would wake up the person when they fall asleep, and Mr. Gerald said that he would look after us until the morning comes. He kept on making coffee and even munched on spices to keep us and himself awake but our efforts were pointless. A few hours after midnight, I suddenly felt hazy and weak when I saw the three of them shut their eyes and their heads fell at the same time. I tried to reach for Alan that was next to me and wake him up, but my hand did not reach him. In a fraction of a second after I extended my hand, I also passed out. It seemed that we were all dragged to sleep against our will. Our dream progressed once again for the last time. I saw myself crossing the shadow stream inside the dark cave. I walked past the small beam of light and walked the long hall that led to the chamber. 
just as how Samuel described. There were carvings of images on the wall along with symbols. It portrayed a human-like horned beast standing on a pedestal, with the people on their knees surrounding him. On the other depiction, which Samuel failed to see, the carvings portrayed three people surrounding him, and he was holding another one in front of his head with his mouth wide open. With these images, I had already had a terrifying idea about what I was about to see, and why we were here. The truth based on the story about this village's past, and with that obvious depictions on the wall, this chamber was not what Alan thought it was. It wasn't a tomb for the dead, but a place where the chosen sacrifices were offered. As I stepped inside this surprisingly spacious room, I saw mountains of countless human bones piled around the middle of a chamber. As I looked around, there was a person standing afar on my left. It was Alan. And on the other side was another person staring right at whatever was behind the tall piles blocking my view. It was Anna. As the three of us stood far from each other, I noticed a very strange sound coming from the center of the chamber. From the ripping of the muscle and skin and the breaking of bones, I could tell that it was the sound of flesh being torn to shreds. After this disturbing sound, I heard a subtle grinding of teeth munching on thick meat. I wanted to shout to Anna and ask her what it was that I was hearing, but there wasn't any sound coming out of my mouth. I was completely terrified since I already have an idea of what it was without even seeing it. Out of fear, I actually didn't want to see it with my own eyes. I battled through my consciousness to force myself to wake, but the dream was like a stubborn nightmare that I couldn't shake off no matter what I did. As I did what I possibly could do to open my eyes, the scene right before me was not changing. As I was able to finally take hold of my consciousness somehow, I was overwhelmingly bewildered by what lied right before me. I suddenly found myself inside the same exact scenario in my dream, standing afar from Alan on my left and Anna on my right. We all arrived inside the chamber coming from different sides, but I couldn't see Samuel. I was in front of the tall piles of human bones, blocking the view of what was exactly on the opposite side of me. And just like in the dream, I started to hear this acutely disturbing sound coming from right behind the mountain of bones. My knees were uncontrollably shaking as I struggled to walk towards Anna. The corner of my eye, the source of this deeply distressing sound was gradually revealed to me as I passed the piles of human remains that blocked my view from the side where I came from. I didn't want to see it. I didn't want to see him. I was already extensively horrified as it was, and I might fall on my knees out of fear alone if I actually laid my eyes on him. But as much as I wanted to avoid it, the tears in Anna's eyes, despite her blank and motionless expression, had led me to look where she was staring at. She looked like she was still unconscious, even though her eyes were open. And yet there was something that was making her cry despite of her unconscious state. And there he was, sitting at the center of the chamber, surrounded by the countless human bones that he consumed for centuries, with his knees pulled against his chest and the other crossed on top of his foot. This merciless giant was chomping on a human so casually right in front of us. His skin was pitch black, like a shadow that bore flesh. His inconveniently long horns were thick and torqued from the base and to the tip, arced from his forehead and down his back. He had multiple tails that were moving like tentacles, swaying back and forth in a very odd motion, leaving after images in its slow and confusing swing. He was staring right at me as he kept on sinking his teeth into the human's flesh, munching it bit by bit. 
as the blood flowed on his arms with every bite he took. When I looked closer, I almost fell on my knees when I realized who it was. This poor person that was being devoured by this cruel beast was no other than Samuel. I wanted to scream, but my hatred was immediately overwhelmed when this thing suddenly spoke. Why are you awake? He directly said to me. He spoke so gently, yet his voice echoed in the entire chamber. He was able to shatter what little that remains of my courage and that I was struggling so hard to hold on to. I was completely astounded. The presence of this thing alone was already profoundly nerve-wracking, and it just gotten far worse when I heard him speak. He was not a mindless beast, but a being that could speak a language that I understood. I did what I could to utter a sentence, and I asked him how could he speak my language. His brief response was both arrogant and effortlessly domineering. He simply answered, I am a god. I have the wisdom that a mere human could never fathom. I felt deeply sorry for Samuel. But it was not the time to mourn. I knew that within a short moment, we were to be devoured as well. I grabbed Anna's shoulder and shook her as hard as I could, but it wasn't enough. I slapped her face really hard until she finally got back to her senses. Right after she regained consciousness, she immediately screamed at the top of her lungs when she saw what was right in front of her. This foul being who claimed to be a god was barely reacting, but he finally made a move when I started dragging Anna back to Alan's side. He simply turned his head to us as we moved further to his back. When we reached the side where his line of sight was blocked by the tall pile of bones, he swung his tail and crushed them as he grinned. When we finally reached Alan, Anna immediately slapped him a couple of times and forced him to wake up. While we were doing what we could to stay in our senses and escape, this thing was just snickering condescendingly. And he spoke once again. Are you escaping? Your faith has been decided long before you were born. You're all here because this is where you should be. Submit yourselves to me. Now, go back to sleep. As he uttered these words, I could feel my consciousness suddenly fading away as if my body itself was responding to his orders voluntarily. I looked at Alan and Anna, and they were also dropping down on their knees like a mindless worshipper. This god started to stretch his arm towards us. He was about to grab one of us next to feed upon. My mind was telling me to run away, and yet I couldn't move my legs for even just an inch. Suddenly, a deafening sound exploded one after the other, and there were consecutive flashes of blinding bright lights. That was the last part I remember before I lost consciousness completely. For the first time in a long time, I could not remember what I dreamt about. The next thing I knew when I woke up, I was lying in the back of a truck. We were on our way back to the city. Anna and Alan were there as well, along with another man that I could not recognize. Sitting next to the driver's seat was Mr. Gerald. He noticed that I was finally awake and asked me if I was feeling alright. The driver viewed me from the front mirror, and he was someone that I had never seen before. When we stopped at a rest stop midway from the bus terminal, Mr. Gerald explained to us what happened. It seemed he also passed out right before the four of us lost consciousness. It was said that this thing who fancied himself as a god was able to stop other people within his territory from interfering with his desires. And when he woke up, the wall of his house was tore open by thick roots that came from the ground. But even before the night came, Mr. Gerald had contacted someone and asked for help and the help arrived just in the nick of time, bearing a bunch of grenades and rifles. They knew that it would be impossible to kill whatever this thing was, but the grenades brought us enough time to get away. 
His eyes were extremely dilated, so consecutive flashes of very bright lights would definitely blind him momentarily. There were five of them who came to our rescue. There would have been more, but this god had his way of instilling fear to people which did not allow them to defy him. Only Gerald and one other villager who bore hatred towards this thing came to our rescue, along with three other outsiders. Sadly, only the three of them survived. The other two were killed when this giant being blindly caught them. They weren't early enough to save Samuel, since he arrived ahead of us inside the chamber. These men who came to our rescue had been following the blogs of Alan, which was updated daily. With the help of his clear descriptions, they were able to locate one of the four entrances of the hidden chamber. These individuals also held a grudge towards the entity. The one sitting with us behind the truck was Alan's dad, and the other one driving the truck was my father. He hid himself from me for years in an attempt to save me from this awful faith that happened to his sister. He thought that if we parted ways, then this god would not be able to get me. He was worried about me and for the safety of my future family. He wanted to cut me out of this awful religion that fell upon our lineage. But he realized it was impossible when he received the call from Gerald. I was rejecting the idea that this foul entity who apparently could speak English was some kind of god. However, I could not come up with any explanation of how we could have walked into his chamber for him to eat us. It seemed like we unknowingly behaved like mindless sheep and were controlled like mere puppets. The moment that we set foot into the village, we were already ensnared in this trap. All of these coincidences that occurred were oddly in his favor, as if he was playing with us in the palm of his hands the entire time. We were extremely fortunate that an unexpected help suddenly came to our rescue. But unfortunately, not all of us were saved. A few days after we got back to the city, my father called me and said that the chain of missing people for every two decades did not end. When they were able to save us, three other individuals went missing. Mr. Gerald and a few other men sealed the cave they entered from, in hopes that it would not be used again. They tried to search for the other three entrances, but they could not find it for some reason. They even said that they felt like they were just running in circles while trying to look for them, as if the forest itself was shifting and they were being played with. A day after that, the cemented big blocks of stones that they placed to the passage was removed. When they returned to seal it again, they also could not find where it was. The three of us, Anna, Allen, and myself, were spared from our awful faith, but the safety of the next generation and our lineage is still questionable. Trying to cut us out of this curse was proven ineffective. So we have to face this terrible thing again, 20 years from now. <laughs>